Discretionary listener participation is advised for the following pro wrestling podcast. I can't wait to feel your love for the Stick to Wrestling podcast tonight. I want to thank Van Halen for writing that song about their favorite podcast, Stick to Wrestling. It is a weekly classic pro wrestling goodness podcast and if you give us 60 minutes perhaps indeed we'll give you a wicked good and raw bone podcast before we get rolling you are invited to join us on facebook just uh search stick to wrestling ask to be in and you'll be in a lot of cool guys talking cool stuff recently we've had less topics uh talking about what's the word i'm looking for um slaughtering your sacred cow he has gone after the road warriors <laughs> jerry lawler nick bockwinkle you have to join and, and retort this crazy man we're having some fun with that and if you want to follow me on twitter just search john mcadam and follow the guy who has the sick to wrestling logo as his avatar and with that Our final Stick to Wrestling of 2022, but we're going to do something new this week, something that's going to be recurring. We're going to talk a specific year of Portland wrestling with a Portland wrestling expert, Frank Culbertson. Frank, thanks for coming on. Hey, great to be here again, and always good to talk about Portland wrestling or or wrestling in general. So thanks for having me on. Excellent. I'm going by, I'm going to use Frank's expertise, but the questions I have come from Mike Rogers' book, Katie Bar the Door. I recommend this book. It is just a, a tremendous handbook of the history of Portland wrestling. It's like an encyclopedia, but condensed. He doesn't get into every bloody detail, but it's a great book if you want to learn about the history of Portland wrestling. I wish every territory had a book like this, Frank. Well, as the editor of the book, it was a lot of fun. A lot of hours went into it to making sure we had most of our details right and uh, to source pictures from a number of photographers uh, that hadn't been seen. Of course, Mike himself has literally garbage bags full of pictures. And so scanning, picking those and scanning them in was a lot of fun. And there is a lot of great information. And if if you've never read about Portland wrestling, this is a great way to find out about it. And if you love Portland wrestling, it'll just bring back memories. And uh, from whatever age you were watching it from, uh, this is a great book and highly recommend it. It's available on Amazon or from John Cosper's Eat, Sleep, Wrestle uh, website. Yeah, and once again, the book is called Katie Bar the Door. That's an expression Frank Bonham used to use. One thing I really liked about the book, Frank, you had mentioned uh, Mike having pictures after picture, and before you even said that, I was very impressed. He had photos of some very abstract wrestlers that went through Portland. And that was a lot of fun, because we would see people that were mentioned in results, and it would take hours upon hours to search for those or contact uh, Ken Hamblin and see if he had any pictures of those. Uh, but there are some uh, some rare ones in there. And uh, so it, it's great to see some pictures of Billy Jack that other people maybe haven't seen before. Um, so it's a, it's a good book. Um, Dutch Savage's son, uh, Mark, is in there. So it's a great book for just to look through the pictures itself. One thing I, I you had mentioned the pictures. One thing I had not known is that uh, Chris Adams, former wife, Jeannie Clark, she was married to Billy Jack Haynes. I did not know that until I started reading the 1982 section. Oh, you know, let's talk about a soap opera. So, oh, yeah. Uh, Chris, Chris and Jeannie are married and uh, they divorce and Billy's on the scene. Billy, of course, uh, handsome, jacked up. A young man, they got together, and then Chris starts training Steve Austin in uh, Texas, and then Steve and Jeannie hook up, and uh, it's just you, you can't a Booker couldn't write this and uh, have it come off as it really did. But yeah, true life story. So there's some great pictures of Billy and uh, Jeannie Clark in the uh, book. Yeah, just like high school, man. So coming into 1982, who were the top baby faces and the top heels in the Portland territory? So uh, at the end of 81, a couple of changes happened. Mike Masters, who had been a a heel, he'd been here about three months. He was on Tales of the Territory, recently passed, unfortunately. Uh, He had just left, lost a Loser Leaf Town match to one of the baby faces, and that would be Rocky Johnson, who had come in late in uh, November of 81. Um, He was one of the 
people that got the audience going. He was a main eventer right away. He did his classic shuffle uh, to get the crowd going when he was making his comeback. He beat Rose, Buddy Rose, in his debut, which was kind of unusual. Portland didn't debut a lot of guys to beat the top guy on top right away, uh, but Rocky did. Rocky and left, I think, uh, in July. He went to the WWF for his run there. Uh, he did not give notice, it is believed, as Dutch Savage made some comments in some matches uh, as the ring announcer that he would not ever return to Portland wrestling. Of course, Rocky and his son seemed to do pretty well for themselves in wrestling, I do believe. Uh, they they did okay. But yeah, I, you know, I read that in the book, and I thought that was really interesting because back in the day, the promoters looked out for each other, and they, they tended not to let guys do stuff like that. But I, I mean, I guess Rocky Johnson really might have been the first for years. I thought it was the Samoans who walked out on Georgia without notice and coming to the WWF. But I guess Rocky beat them to it. And other wrestlers had left without notice, and um, Don Owen, uh, being well-connected, uh, was able to get people, uh, we'll use the term blackballed, for a while. And some of them didn't work for six months. And so it was just, a, you know, you gave your two weeks or a month notice was standard and moved to another territory. But Rocky had big things planned for himself in the WWF at the time. And, you know, the business was about to change. Vince had just bought uh, the WWWF from his dad in in 82. WrestleMania was coming in the horizon in a couple of years. So the business was changing, and uh, Rocky evidently saw some of that and decided to make the move when he did. I know back in the day, uh, you know, Vince McMahon, a guy like Vince McMahon would come to an agreement with Rocky Johnson, and he'd call Don Owen and say, you know, Don, can you finish Rocky up in about six weeks? And, you know, yeah, of course, he's going to New York anyway, but he, he do, would do that as a a courtesy to the former promoter. And I'm, I'm really surprised that Vince wouldn't have done that for Don Owen. I mean, Don was so well-respected by everybody. Absolutely. He, um, you know, classic, just got into the Wrestling Hall of Fame, uh, the Observer yes. Wrestling Hall of Fame uh, recent last year, I believe. And uh, it's good to see him in there. But yeah, Don, well-respected, been around forever. You know, Portland wasn't a big territory by any stretch of the imagination, but Don was well-respected and it had run the business solidly, made a lot of money here in Portland for a while. Absolutely. All right. So let's, let's start with Brett Sawyer. Brett Sawyer, uh, last part of 81, he comes in. I think he had been there. I think he showed up like July or August 1981. And he the, the Pacific Northwest title was vacant. They had a battle royal for the title, which I think is, is I think is much smarter than a lot of like having a tournament where everyone has to do a job. And Brett Sawyer becomes the Pacific Northwest heavyweight champion. In Mike's book, he said it was a little bit of a surprise because he didn't see Brett Sawyer as that big a star. Yeah, he had been here first, uh, I believe in 1980, he had actually made a couple of appearances. Uh, Russ came in and tag teamed with his brother, of course, Buzz Sawyer. But he was small, even for Portland, which wasn't a, a, a large man territory. And so he was really, really small, but he was a really good bumper. And he got a ton of sympathy from the crowd because he was so small and he could sell. The other thing he liked to do was he was a bleeder. Oh, yeah. Portland used blood uh, fairly regularly on the main events, whether they were on TV or off. Uh, but he did win the Battle Royal. I mean, you had Rose and, and Johnson and a bunch of other wrestlers around that people would have thought would have been the champion. Rip Oliver had just recently made his return as well. But Brett won. Uh, he held the title for quite a while. I think he lost to, I believe it was Rip Oliver. Rip Oliver, April 24th. And then Oliver held the title for a while. Sawyer and him went back and forth in, in October and September and October later in the year, tie, changing the titles back and forth. And then Brett left in December of 81. He has a famous match out there. If you want to look it up, it's on YouTube in September. It was Sawyer and Steve Pardee tag teaming against Rip Oliver and the assassin who had been here as the destroyer. Uh, Fidel Sierra, uh, uh, Top Gun in Portland, a number of uh, uh, different identities. And that match was stopped on account of blood. 
and uh, which was used sometimes in Portland, but uh, he had hit an artery and he bled tremendously. And instead of going to the dressing room to get stitched up or cleaned up, he went up to the crow's nest and he is just, it's a, a truly a, a crimson mask through his entire body. When I first saw that match, I was like, this is the bloodiest I have ever seen a wrestler. It looked like he jumped into a pool of blood and, and jumped out. It was insane. Yeah, and that's that was uh, his part of his gimmick. He would bleed on little house shows at the high schools. It didn't matter because because of his size, he needed something to get the crowd behind him. And bleeding was what he he did. Um, he's still around. He's on Facebook. Uh, people can reach out to him and and talk to him every once in a while. Uh, but Brett had a good run here in Portland, especially for the size that he was. I think the next there's two other baby faces. The first one was guy named Chris Adams who did well for himself in the business. He had come in in May of uh, 82. Uh, he had been in LA for NWA Hollywood, uh, wrestling down in Mexico for the UWA. He came in and he got, he got a pretty good push right away. He was not in main events, but he was wrestling. What Portland normally did was have the guy come in and win uh, a few matches against the lower card guys and then maybe win a battle royal later. And uh, that would elevate him. But he comes in and he's beating guys like Mike Miller, who had a long run in Portland, but at this point was not a really great worker uh, and had just come into Portland. A guy named Tiny Anderson, guy that we'll talk about, I'm sure here, uh, Dizzy Hogan, uh, Brutus Beefcake. He was getting wins over those. He got elevated, got into some matches with uh, Rip Oliver. Uh, most of them ended in draws. Portland did a lot of draws. If you look at the records, I did. I did notice that you don't see many time limit draws in the WWE or AEW anymore. Portland uh, had their fair share of them. Uh, he was wrestling uh, then uh, David Schultz. Uh, most of those ended in DQs, of course. Um, and then suddenly in July, they put him back drawing uh, Hogan with Miller with uh, Tommy Rogers of the Fantastics, who was basically had only been in the business for about four months at the time that he was in Portland. So lower card guy, smaller. He leaves for New Japan for a short couple of weeks. He comes back and they still have him wrestling. The guys like T.G. Stone, um, Chris Colt, who if you ever want to be fascinated by somebody in wrestling, research Chris Colt. Oh, there are Chris Colt stories out there. I mean, there's there's. Yes. Stories about all kind. Every guy has a story, you know, in wrestling. But Chris Colt was was pretty special. Yes. Um, in November, he got another push. He started teaming with Billy Jack, uh, which was leading to the stories that we talked about with uh, his with Chris Adams's wife. And then, for no reason, he was back wrestling Chris Colts and nobody's uh, in the business as far as main eventers in Portland. He left in March and he went to. Um, WCCW after a two week tour of Japan. And that's where Chris really had great success down in Texas. Um, legendary uh, matches down there with a number of people. But in Portland, he was just, he got some push, but he never really got what he maybe should have had when you look at the success that he was about to have in Texas. Yeah, I look at guys like Chris Adams, and you know, back in 1982, I look at guys like Chris Adams, like Brett Sawyer, like Billy Jack Haynes. I mean, to me, they are ideal baby faces for Portland because – you know, they're all three are talented guys, and they're talented guys who are on their way up in the business. I, I thought Brett Sawyer did a great job in Georgia. Chris Adams obviously went on to big things in, in Texas, and Billy Jack Haynes, you know, became a star in Florida. So, I mean, I, I thought Portland was a great launching pad for all three of them, and Tommy Rogers as well. Yeah, and back in the territory days, that's where when you were working six, seven, nine days a week. Uh, that's where the guys got the experience that some of the guys today simply don't get. Um, and so a guy like Tommy Rogers, four months in the business, comes in, he's working seven days. Portland was an easy territory to for travel. Um, he gets experience against some good uh, guys. There was nothing wrong. It was never the term jobber really was is, is newer in vocabulary for wrestling. Um, they were enhancement talent. They were learned to be good hands, as they say. 
um, help put the other people over and elevate. They knew their position. So when they come in and then they lose, uh, it wasn't seen as something terrible. It was just part of learning the business and working your way up the ladder or finding your way to a new territory with some experience. Yeah, I noticed, you know, when I watch Portland wrestling um, and they did not have squash matches per se, like like Georgia, like the WWF, like the AWA, et cetera. You know, everyone on the card had their place. They didn't just bring guys in to do jobs uh, for tapings. Off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you, and I've been um, uh, I've been a wrestling fan since 1965. I've watched Portland wrestling uh, when it was on, probably nonstop since 67 or 68, and I can't ever remember job matches or matches where squashes happened. Uh, that just was not what Portland did, and so everybody had to have some sort of ability to work. And so you look at, at some guys that uh, were new in the business, and they would put them with somebody that was a Ricky Hunter, uh, somebody who could really work and lead them through the matches. And that's what Portland did a lot of times, so that the guy learned actually in the ring as he was going and knew what to do because the guy that he was working with was able to call the matches and uh, get them through them. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned you mentioned Billy Jack Haynes. If you want to jump to that, well, I was going to say Portland. Portland was a little bit like the NFL. I mean, you have your top teams like the Kansas City Chiefs, and then you have your lower teams like the Houston Texans. But I mean, look what happened when Houston and Kansas City played. You know, I mean, it, it, Houston almost won, and that's kind of how I see Portland. There's not like that, you know. M- that guy who kind of doesn't belong in the ring and isn't fighting back against a big star. Absolutely. And um, I'll go to Matt Bourne, who obviously the son of uh, tough Tony Bourne. Matt had some great amateur wrestling skills, but that doesn't necessarily translate to the ring, as we have seen a number of times where wrestlers just they it's a different, different sport. And so in Portland, his first matches were against a Johnny Eagles, a Ricky Hunter, a Hector Guerrero. And a lot of them went to draws, and he would beat uh, a guy by like Race Bannon or or a hero Oda. But most of his early matches were with guys who were good hands, could walk him through so that he learned uh, how to sell, how to read the audience, uh, how to pace a match. Pacing in today's wrestling matches generally is uh, on super speed. Uh, but back in the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, you had to learn how to pace the match because uh, your and your your crews weren't giant, so if Portland had twelve to sixteen guys maximum, um, and you were filling out a three hour card, you had to know how to pace the matches so that uh, the the crowd would stay with you the whole time. A lost art. Yeah, no more super kick parties. <laughs> Personal opinion. Personal opinion. No, no I get hate mail for no, that. I mean, I mean, but you, you know, it's Portland ran weekly towns and you can't, you can't do that going fast forward the whole time every week. You know, you, you have to pace it out. If you're, again, if you're having those weekly shows in, in the same town. Correct. Correct. Um, I lost one. I'll mention for the face was Billy Jack Haynes, who's, who had come in from being trained up in the, uh, by uh, the hearts. He had been a bodyguard for Jack Foley. Then he started tagging with Bruce Hart. Came in in October of uh, 82, right on top, right away. Portland had had a, and he's a Portland boy, and Portland had just had a bad experience with another one, Mike Popovich, who had come in, got pushed right away as the guy coming out of the audience. Yeah, been a football player for the University of Oregon. And then As Mike and I just did an interview with Mike Popovich because he kind of dropped off the face of the earth, and it's in Excitement in the Air, Volume 3, available on Amazon as well. An interview with Mike Popovich where he, quote unquote, found religion, couldn't put wrestling and his faith together, and just left the business and walked away from it. So they went with Billy, gave him a big push, and uh, he did, he was very successful. I've worked with Billy a number of times in promotions since then. Uh, my first job in wrestling was as a TV announcer for Pacific Coast Championship Wrestling back in 88, which was the remains of Billy Jack's failed OWF promotion in Portland. So I've known Billy for a long time. Uh, he's an unusual character. 
Um, you never know what you're going to get with Billy, the good Billy or the not so good Billy, we'll say. Uh, but he's still around and he has a ton of uh, respect in Portland. Uh, some of his matches are legendary. And so you would get into 1983, his matches with uh, Rip Oliver, legendary, one of the legendary feuds, probably top four in Portland history. Also, you can find the Rip Oliver versus uh, as Santa Claus attacking Billy Jack Haynes out there on YouTube. Uh, it's another bloodbath. Uh, I've surprised everybody because nobody knew Rip was coming back. Those are the top baby faces. If you want to talk heels, we can do those quickly. Uh, Rip Oliver, uh, who has a 16-time Pacific Northwest, no, 12-time Pacific Northwest heavyweight champion, 16-time tag champ. Um, mentioned that he had uh, won the titles uh, three times that year in 82 alone. Uh, just a classic heel for Portland. He had a different look. We'd had Rip Rogers here with the blonde hair. Uh, Rose, he later changed his hair to more blonde than the natural color it was. Uh, but Rip came in with the blonde hair and the black beard. A totally different look. Wasn't a great worker when he got here, but learned to talk put him with Rose early, and that really put Rip to the top. Rip has been on the top of Portland for many, many, many years. David Schultz, I don't even know where to begin with David Schultz, came in, got some in May, I believe, of 82. He had been working up in um, Calgary for Stampede. He starts just winning matches with regular people. He's not aligned with anybody in particular. Um, and then in July, they start a feud with uh, Buddy Rose, which ends in a – and both were heels, although David Schultz at the time was getting more cheers because Buddy was so hated. Schultz went on uh, TV and was trying to tell people, don't jump on, on my bandwagon. I don't like you fans. I'm not here for anybody's approval. And wrestling fans just seemed to like David Schultz. He was known to be brutal tough or we'll call it snug in the ring and he was in portland they had a series of chain matches him and buddy they knew buddy was leaving for the wwf at the time but it just kept dragging out they uh, usually matches like this would end in just a couple of weeks in portland maybe five weeks at the most this went on for closer to two months and then rose beat schultz in the deciding match in seattle and you would think Schultz would leave because that's what was scheduled, and he did leave, but Rose left as well. So you had this giant feud on top where the winner and the loser both leave the territory. Very unusual. That is unusual. Now, I want to ask you about Buddy Rose. In Mike's book, he said that there was a rumor that Buddy Rose was going to the WWF. Now, I know that this is Mike speaking, but, I mean, did you hear that rumor? And if if so, like how – how did you hear that? Like, let me let me take a step back. I remember hearing a rumor at the Boston Garden that Hulk Hogan and Brutus Beefcake were brothers, and that turned out not to be true. But, you know, that was me talking to the guy <laughs> next to me. Like, how did you guys find out that he might have been departing? So Mike had started his partnership in, in newsletters with uh, other fans, fan clubs. Um, that's where he started getting connected. Ah. Meltzer, First Wrestling Observer, came out in 82, I believe. Um, so those things were around. And, um, of course, there was no thing called the Internet at the time. So it was mostly in fan newsletters, uh, things, conversations Mike would be having. Mike had uh, become friends with certain individuals in the business that would actually share some information with him. And that's, that's where that came from. But, uh, yeah, both of them actually left at the same time which left some holes in the Portland territory for sure. Yeah, I am not someone who has like, you know, every episode of Portland wrestling. I just have, you know, the scattershot uh, footage that's out there. And I was always wondering, you know, what's going on with Buddy Rose and David Schultz? You know, they're who's the baby face here, you know? And then that answers my question that, you know, they were they were both heels, which is kind of which is kind of weird, especially that they they blow off the feud and leave at the same time. Well, in Portland had usually did the face and heel thing. I can think back in when they had, um, if we went back to the early 70s, when you had tag teams of the Von Steigers, you had Maine and Bourne, 
uh, Fuji and Sasaki. Uh, so we had a lot of heel versus heels in the tag team division, but rarely in the singles division did Portland do heel versus heel. But yeah, um, David Schultz in his book says that uh, uh, he gave his notice and left because he was considered, Don had told him that he needed to lighten up. If you watch Tales from the Territory, there were a few descriptions of Buddy Rose as not being the toughest individual, we'll just say. And so uh, working with David Schultz would have been very difficult for him if uh, that was really how Buddy was perceived as, as being a bit soft. But he was a great worker, a great bumper, spectacular on the mic. But yeah, except for his face turn in 83, uh, with against Rip Oliver, Dynamite Kid, and the Assassin, but he was a heel the entire time, and he was a much better heel than he was a face for sure. Oh, definitely. Uh, I mean, we'll do 1983 at some point, but I mean, Buddy seemed like he was over like cr- crazy as a baby face. It was almost like the fans were were waiting for that moment to happen, and it, it finally did. It did, and um, I, you know, I can visually I can remember it right now uh, talking about it uh, with the fans storming yeah. the ring and. The, the complete change, uh, it was so unexpected, really. Uh, but it just, it over time, it didn't play out like I think it should have, just because he was more comfortable, personally, being the, the heel than he was the face. He worked hard at being a face, and the fans took to it at first, but soon it, it kind of it kind of changed off. Oh, really? It, I, I saw that it got off to a hot start, but you're saying that it, it kind of petered out as time went on. So I always, I always wondered, you know, wow, they, they turned him back real quick in my opinion, but you're saying that, you know, basically it, it, it slowed down from the, the highlights I saw. Yeah, I would say that would be absolutely accurate. Um, and that happens, you know, people who, who get turned and it's unexpected. So you get the big pop. Uh, and then it's how you sustain that. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't in the long run. 82 seemed like a really good year for Portland because you look back in like 80, 81, your, your top baby faces are guys like Jay Youngblood. Um, it, 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 you know, whenever I read about it in a magazine, it felt a little bit minor league. But in 82, they had some major stars coming in uh, like Rocky Johnson, like David Schultz. And that raises the bar like uh what's that old expression the when the tide rises all the boats ride rise with it that makes it a better place for a guy like billy jack haynes a rip oliver a chris adams to get over when you've got guys like rocky johnson and david schultz in the mix absolutely then brutus beefcake dizzy hogan uh was here for uh half of the year or three quarters of the year another guy really had some talent had a, had a really good luck, and he was pushing the fact that he was – was he pushing the fact that he was Hogan's brother or cousin? I think it was brother. Uh, well, I think it was his brother. You know, those times get confusing, the exact words. But he was – he came in. They teamed him with Rose so that he would get some a push right away. In tag matches, he was the guy that was doing the job. Uh, Rose was never going to be that guy. Uh, so, But just that affiliation got him over. He had some big wins. He got you know pushes with uh, uh, Rocky and then uh, Kurt Henning, a guy that uh, you haven't mentioned yet, but Kurt was here early in his first run here in Portland. Uh, he would come back in 83 and have a, a big feud with uh, Buddy Rose. But you had a Kurt Henning, a Dynamite Kid was here for just a week, but you could see that Dynamite was set to come back and help do the flare or a Rose turn. Uh, so we had a lot of talent, and Billy Jack Haynes, young in his career, ended the year right on top. Rose came back uh, for a match and put him over on Christmas night, and that solidified Billy as the biggest heel that, or biggest babyface that there was. Yeah, I mean, I remember you know reading about Billy Jack Haynes in the magazines, especially the Kiter magazines, and they they made it sound like okay, we've got a a major star that's about to break out right now. He's in Portland, but that's not going to last forever. Correct. Yeah. And Billy, you know, he was a face for years until he did his return as a as a heel and talking about the fans of Oregon didn't support him when he went to the WWF uh, for that failed run that should have been successful, uh, but due to Billy's own doings. This is now is this 84 or 86. 
I think 84, yeah. if memory yeah. serves me correct. And he came back and he hated the fans of Oregon. Um, and then later he would love the fans of Oregon and then he would hate the fans of Oregon. And, you know, he, he uh, feuded with Rip Oliver for a long time. Like I mentioned, legendary matches. Uh, and then he would actually team towards the end of the promotion. He would be teaming with Rip Oliver uh, in an unusual situation. But Billy's uh, a very interesting character. Most of the stories that you hear about him are true. I know one story I'll tell you, he uh, and I were, I was doing television for not Portland, but another local promotion that came after Don Owens folded. And he was trying to tell me he was going to wrestle Rip Oliver. He says, Frank, I, I don't even know who's going to win this match tonight. It's going to be a real war. And I just wanted to tell him, I know who's going to win because I had the TV lineup right there. <laughs> So Billy was uh, one of those guys that, you know, always tried to keep kayfabe and, and make keep it real no matter who you were. But Billy's an interesting character. Interesting. Uh, uh, so uh, so I have heard. I mean, my, my one Billy Jack Haynes story, we were in Memphis in 1995, and he was wrestling down there. And we were at a bar after the matches at the Mid-South Coliseum. And for those who don't know, Billy Jack, you know, the first – part of his career for years you know that he'd kick off every interview on billy you know i am billy jack he, by the way he wasn't using billy jack haynes at this point yeah i think that started in 84 or 85 but you know he'd come out and be like I, you know i don't drink i don't smoke and i don't do drugs and i see him walking past me hit the bar with a cigarette in one hand and a drink in the other and i was all i could do to not laugh <laughs> that's that's billy uh, i guess there's one one more heel that we should probably talk about and that's matt Bourne. we mentioned him a little bit but this was because this ties into tales of the territory where they kind of glossed over the matt Bourne buddy rose feud due to buddy marrying matt's sister which was legit it was absolutely happened in in june of 81 he married uh, tony ray and the, for whatever reason they didn't want to cover on tales of the territory but it was a Police were called a domestic violence situation. Matt heard of and went over and um, uh, attacked Buddy. Buddy and the police, uh, Matt was arrested, spent the night in jail. He was obviously very irate. I worked at a, I was a, in accounting for a company, a, a restaurant company that Tony Ray actually worked at. And so I remember when this happened because we had to make sure that there was security at our restaurant uh, for about two weeks after this incident. They didn't cover it much, but they had done an angle right after that where uh, Buddy wrestled Matt. And if Matt lost, he had to join Buddy Rose's army. And Matt did. And he just on TV said, well, it's just the this is the way I got to make more money. That's what's going to happen. Everybody expected there to be really hard feelings because there were truly hard feelings in real life. But the two of them worked really well in the ring together. Matt had a great run as a heel. He was beating a bunch of guys. And then in June of 82, he left for the Carolinas for another famous story where he uh, was working mid-Atlantic, teaming with Arn Anderson. And they were to get a giant push. And then due to circumstances that uh, some people say it's just uh, there was a fight. Some people say there was uh, it was drug related. Matt was known to party hard. I personally know someone who knows Matt who said it involved a, a, a motel incident where a female was put through a window. I, I've never seen a police report, so I can't confirm that. All this person knows knew Matt very well. So all of a sudden, Matt is back in Portland in July of 83, and the person, the team that got the spot from Arn Anderson and Matt Bourne was this team called the Road Warriors. I don't know if you've heard of them. I've heard of them. They're very abstract, but they've heard of them. Yes. Uh, when talk about um, blackballing, when Matt came back, uh, he'd been a top star in Portland and out. And he comes back and he is doing preliminary matches for six months straight, like a probation, uh, something Don must have agreed to, to get him back in the business. Uh, but Matt Bourne was a big heel in, in 19, the first part of 1982. 
Always an interesting character. Always interesting. The, the story I heard about Matt Bourne, uh, it involved an underage girl, and when it was when it was all said and done, that could not uh, enter the state of Ohio without uh, per- being subject to arrest, and that's why he was no longer with Georgia Championship Wrestling in in eighty three. <laughs> That's all possible. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that's what was alleged many moons ago. And Matt's daughter has joined the uh, Facebook page called Fans of Portland Wrestling. I encourage people to apply for to be able to join that group. And she has recently uh, given me permission to post some pictures of Matt as a dad and Tony as a granddad with uh, Matt's son and, and with uh, his daughter, some great family pictures and paints a whole different side of Matt that we don't always see or we don't always hear about. We hear about the maniac part of him. But there was a side of Matt that he was a really good family man, a loving father and husband. So uh, I encourage people, fans of Portland Wrestling on Facebook. It's a great, great site. To and go you to. shared those on Twitter, as a matter of fact. Absolutely. Excitement Air on Twitter. Uh, if you want to follow that would be terrific as well. We try to post things uh, on a regular basis, um, whether they're pictures or results we find interesting. Um, so excitement air on Twitter. Thank you. Hey, you're very welcome. And you know what? I mean, I love that there's a group like that because, I mean, you know, let's face it, Portland was a smaller territory. You know, it's not it wasn't like the WWF where you've got, you know, New York, Philadelphia, Boston, Pittsburgh, et cetera. It's, it's kind of a, a one city town. And then you had satellite uh, towns. And, you know, I, I'm very happy that 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 group is out there and that, you know, you guys share your memories. I will be joining that group as soon as I'm done or asking to join that group as soon as we're done recording. Well, the moderator is Rich Patterson, who is the one who uh, took all of the Buddy Rose tapes of Portland wrestling and cleaned them all up and put them out there. So if you see Portland wrestling tapes from the early days, seventies, eighties, most of those are from Rich Patterson. So he's uh, the moderator. He's a, great guy and um we're very thankful for his working in helping save the video of portland wrestling when video tapes just weren't available absolutely they had some really interesting stuff on those tapes like you know a very young gino hernandez working in portland you know buddy rose's earliest days etc i mean that, that was some good stuff and yeah we we all owe rich a big thank you for that Absolutely. Let's talk about Ric Flair going to Portland for the first time. Ric Flair wins the NWA championship uh, September of 1981, and he has his first run in Portland in April. What was it like having Ric Flair appear on TV for the first time? And so Rick's matches on uh, usually were uh, not on television. Of course, he would do an interview to bring the, you know, the, the champion rare on Portland rarely appeared on, on TV. But having that, like when Gene Kaninsky would come in, that was always a big deal, or, or the Funks would come in. The Having the, Nash, the NWA champion come in was a big deal. Flair was so different than the other champions that we had seen. You know, Kaninsky with this Canadian jacket, Funk with the, the more of a cowboyish Texas-type outfit or type drawl. Uh, Flair was completely different. And he came in, and, and he had a, a run for a week. He wrestled... Brett Sawyer a couple of times, which was really unusual because there were a lot of other guys that I would have thought would have got the match. But he wrestled uh, Brett Sawyer twice, once in Seattle, which was a a big draw, uh, a big place for Portland. He wrestled Buddy Rose once in Portland on a Tuesday night with the special referee was Kurt Hinnon um, because Rose and Hinnon were at each of the throats. So he was there to make sure that things went went fair. And that was uh, Flair as really the heel in that, uh, and Rose as the heel, and hitting there as the referee. He wrestled Rocky Johnson a couple of times in Salem. He wrestled him in Eugene. He wrestled him actually in Salem twice. And then they wrestled once in a city called Longview, Washington, which is about 60 miles from Portland. At that time, I'm going to imagine that the population was maybe 30,000 people, so not a big town, uh, just off of the freeway I-5, um, so an hour north of Portland. That would happen in Portland. So you would have uh, Salem, and Eugene, Medford sometimes uh, down south, and Seattle and Portland for the big matches. But to have a world championship match in Longview, Washington was pretty unheard of. 
but that's uh, what Portland would do. They would draw tremendously well in small places like that. Portland didn't save all their big matches or title changes just for Portland. It would regularly happen in, in Salem, smaller town, or Eugene. I think that's really smart, especially for a territory like Portland. Like you're you're showing the fans that, look, if you come to this show it, uh, in the city of 30,000 people, the title really might change hands. Absolutely. And and it happened whether you were in a lumber town, which, you know, Oregon was famous for <laughs> for a while, or Portland, you, titles would just change hands. And sometimes they would change hands. I can think of matches where the title changed hands in Salem on a Thursday, and then it, they would reverse it on a Friday in Eugene. But again, without internet, people didn't know what was happening or that this finish was the same uh, as in another town. And so uh, title changes, tag title changes happened all over the territory. And that's really what kept fans coming back. Because if if you knew exactly what was going to happen and that this team had no chance of winning, then you weren't as likely to go. But if you were holding on to that hope, and that's what wrestling was sold on, was here's here's what's going to happen. You never know who's going to win. And that happened when Flair was here. Some of them were double countouts or with Rocky Johnson that went to a draw. And then he beat Rocky clean in, in Eugene. So uh, you just never knew what was going to happen. And again, I, I think that's the way you, you have to run a territory, you know, like Portland, like Memphis. You have to, you know, have it clear that, hey, anything can happen tonight, even though this is kind of a spot show. A big thing that happened in Portland in 1982 was the passing of Frank Bonima. And when I first started getting tapes of Portland wrestling, this is like 87, it took me forever to find out who the announcers were because they didn't talk about themselves. They didn't think <laughs> about themselves. And, you know, I finally found out, and I can't even think of the name of the person who replaced Bonima, but I, I remember what he looks like. I mean, what was it like, you know, having that, that, uh, Change of the guard in Portland. I mean, Frank Frank Bonham, I think, had been doing it for like 15 years, right? Yeah, Frank uh, passed away. He was uh, a young man at 49 years old, uh, totally unexpected. He had been doing it for 15 years from the time that uh, Portland was originally on Coin 6, which is a CBS affiliate here in Portland. It had been there for a number of years, and it, then it moved over to KPTV 12, where it was till the end of the uh, promotion. Frank was a deadpan type guy. He wasn't overly excited when he was calling the action in the ring. And Don Koss, who took over for him, was actually had been in the sales department at Channel 12, hadn't done announcing, hadn't been uh, a wrestling big fan, uh, was thrust into that. Uh, they put Stan Stasiak with him for a while to help him through. Um, Dutch Savage did some announcing with him uh, also to help you know, learn the ropes. He was a much more excitable guy who would uh, tell some jokes sometimes. Uh, totally different. Frank was focused on the action in the ring. He knew people weren't there to see him. Uh, you know, he wasn't ever going to, I don't think, yeah, I never think Frank ever took a bump as sometimes announcers did in other territories. He was just your straight announcer. Uh, and that's what Portland did. Portland did that with referees, whether it was Sandy Barr or Shag Thomas, who also passed away in that same year. If you watch the matches, they would be in the back corner of the ring unless they had to get in and, and break the hold or um, you know push somebody off of the ring. They were always out of the action, never the focus, until Shag sometimes, as he was a former wrestler, used to have matches in the 60s with Luther Lindsay that were uh, – evidently epic. I never saw them, but all reports are epic. Uh, they would rip his t-shirt and that would end up, you know, fines and suspension type deals. But Frank was beloved, always remembered, a tall, thin man, but very deadpan, way different than announcers today. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a different product, but I remember uh, Sir Oliver Humperdinck attacking Gordon Soley uh, on Florida wrestling in 1980. And my, my reaction was, this is garbage. Just don't do, you know, the, to me, that's like kind of crossing the line, attacking the announcer. Right. And, be, and because it, he doesn't have any way for a comeback. In Portland, there was a, a famous sponsor, Tom Peterson, who sold televisions and appliances. What an amazing sponsor he was, by the way. Dream sponsor. 
and a very, very nice man. Him and his wife both uh, I was friends with um, and sponsored me when I did Portland Wrestling on Comcast. Uh, very nice people. But they, the, the kangaroos, Boyd and Charles came up and broke their television and they couldn't attack Tom because there was no way for Tom to get back. But breaking the TVs, the sponsors got together and they did some bounty hunters where we brought in to get rid of these kangaroos. And it went on for six or eight months where people would come in to try to beat them and never could. But that was the only way a, a sponsor could get back. But other than that, attacking somebody who's not a wrestler kind of defeats the purpose it really does especially you know if it, i mean you well you can't you can't have a baby face do it but if a heel does it like we were talking about i mean you know to me that's just like okay that's garbage wrestling uh don't do it so buddy rose like when when he left for the wwf how was that explained on tv or was it acknowledged at all so they would say things like uh they were going to new york and that was pretty well it. That was a big deal. They they wouldn't necessarily they wouldn't save the WWF. The only one I can think of was was when Billy did leave to represent Oregon for Vince McMahon. They did a deal a promo that they ran on WWF of him on a horse because that's all we do here in Oregon is ride horses. <laughs> so that was acknowledged. Rip Oliver, it, when he went to for his cup of coffee, uh, as they would say in the WWF. It was just that he was uh, going to New York, uh, but it wasn't specific as to what federation that that they were going to. They just kind of they were just gone. OK, that makes sense. Now, Stan Stasiak returns to Portland in 1982. Um, I, I remember them talking on TV about, you know, Stan's. You know, they were they were candid about it. They were like, Stan's near the end of his career. If you need a salesperson in your organization, you might want to call him. <laughs> <laughs> that one cracked. And I loved it. It felt very, very homey. Um, but, I mean, what was your thoughts on Stan Stasiak? I mean, when he was in the WWF in like 77, 78, towards the end of his run there, I mean, to me, he started looking old. And here we are four or five years later. How was Stan Stasiak received? Okay, so – to be candid, uh, Stan Stasiak was one of my all-time favorites as a child. I, uh, he was in my very first match I ever went to at the old Portland Armory long before the sports arena in downtown Portland. And it was Stasiak versus Don Leo Jonathan. I can, that's all I can remember is seeing Stasiak walk past me as I was around the restroom area in this big armory. And he said hi, kind of like the Mean Joe Green Coat commercial. Oh, nice. Once he said hi to me. He was my favorite forever and ever and ever. The devastating heart punch I knew killed people. And he's from Buzzards Creek, Oregon, or at least that's what they said on (laughs) WWF TV. Yeah, yeah, uh, Buzzards Creek. And then so when he won, as I read in the uh, after mags, when he won the championship in 73 for a full nine days, that was an amazing deal to me that somebody from Portland was a, a world champion. That was a big deal. So Stan has been my favorite for a very, very long time, and I was just just so impressed that uh, he had that position, even if it was only for nine days, because not many people got to be world champion. No, he was he was the guy who, who took out Pedro Morales after three years. That by itself is a big deal. It is a big deal. People, you know... Uh, ridicule him on on twitter sometimes about how you know short run it is that was an honor back then mike in an interview that he did with stan asked him what he thought about that match going in did he know that he was going to win and he said stan just totally kayfabed it and told him well i i only knew when i pinned him okay (laughs) sure stan thank you stan was old i'm 65 so i i know what older men's bodies look like and we don't have the muscle tone we had when we were 20s and 30s 40s and stan looked old uh he looked out of shape he would still get a rise when he would put the arm the person's arm behind their head for the heart punch the crowd would cheer because he had been here so many times had so many legendary feuds but he was old and he he then moved into announcing he would every once in a while would come back they put him with billy jack at the end of the year and that was because Billy was still so green and you needed somebody who could lead him in matches, even if they were tag matches. 
um, somebody who could take Billy aside and, and help him with, even on interviews. Uh, and so that was Stan's role here in Portland towards the end of his career. He definitely was slow. Uh, he was never, I'm not going to say he was fast, but he was agile for a big man, which is why his matches with Don Leo Jonathan w- were good because Don Leo was a spectacular athlete. But that was Stan's role here towards the end of his career, and especially in 82, just to help Billy Jack get over. That makes a lot of sense because, you know, I mean, I, you know, watching Portland from 82, or early 83, I mean, I saw all kinds of potential in Billy Jack Haynes. He really had the look and the feel of a major superstar, but you're right. He was green as grass. And you see wrestlers on television nowadays, and I, I don't mean this in a, in a negative way, but you can tell when they're green and it just comes from time in the ring. It comes from experience. So you can be super strong, uh, have a great body, uh, be able to do athletic moves, but it just doesn't come across as a professional wrestling match. It doesn't come across as necessarily believable. And that's what Stan was there for with Billy's. Make him slow down. Uh, tell him maybe this is the time that you're going to do the full Nelson or tease the full Nelson, which was Billy's finisher. Don absolutely loved full Nelson finishers. He had used it with Jesse, with uh, Mike Masters, uh, with a number of guys throughout years. Um, and that was Billy's uh, finishing move for sure was the full Nelson. But knowing when to put it on, uh, how to tease that he's going to put it on and the heel gets away, that was a big deal. Stan knew all those things. That makes a lot of sense. And the the full Nelson is the end of a real fight, as we as we all know. If you had to <laughs> give me who was Portland's MVP in your opinion for the year nineteen eighty two, Frank? Oof. I know there are a lot of candidates. Uh, so I would probably you know, a guy we didn't mention who was on top for the whole year was Ali Hassan, the Sheik. Jack Cougar. Uh, uh, Jack Cougar. Yeah, from Indianapolis. He was a top guy here in Portland. Uh, once he grew his beard, you know, he was really the believable chic uh, type character. Portland had a number of those come through. I'm, I'm probably going to say for the entire year, it would probably be Rip. He was uh, always on top. He was uh, setting up the legendary thing with uh, his clan. Uh, he had a carryout stretcher that I actually owned for a number of years. Uh, was a supposed stretcher where they would put people on and it said carry out service uh, courtesy of the clan you had that wow oh later on television they actually had to paint over the words clan and uh it was just the carry out stretcher it was just plumber's pipe uh rope and a tarp uh, not even an actual stretcher but i think rip was really coming into his own then you know, Rocky Johnson came and went. Um, Billy Jack was just here at the very end. He would probably be it for, for 1983. Rose was in and out too often for me to give him the whole year. Piper, of course, came in a couple of times, had some matches, uh, but was not here. He was generally in in Georgia or Midwest at the time. So I'll, I'm going to have to say Rip Oliver three-time Pacific Northwest heavyweight champion that year. I was going to say he, you know, he's the, he was the champion three times and he took over the lead heel role for Buddy Rose. We're we're running out of time here, but I'd love to hear about this. How did that transition go when Buddy left for New York for a little while and Rip Oliver kind of filled that void? It's no longer Buddy Rose's army. It's uh, Rip Oliver's clan. They brought in, uh, Fidel Sierra, David Sierra, who had been here previously as the destroyer and now as the, the assassin, and really put that together uh, as the lead group, lead heel group. They brought other people in to, to make it a three-way uh, dynamite kid early in 83 with the Rose turn. And so that's really how they, they just covered it, was elevated, took Rose out, Oliver had been right there, like a number two heel in the territory. When Rose left, they just elevated him up. The assassin, a great worker, Fidel, in fact, worked for me for Portland a number of times and had some great matches uh, with uh, Grappler, Lynn Denton, and uh, had some really good matches with Roddy when Roddy worked some matches for me. So that's how they covered it, just elevated it. It wasn't a big deal. 
they were now the people beating everybody down. Okay, so yeah, so it, so it transitioned smoothly. Like they didn't have a, a drop in interest or attendance or anything like that. No, uh, wrestling was doing pretty good in in eighty two. Once WrestleMania happened, uh, the business started changing rapidly, and people started leaving, and things started to change. But Portland was pretty strong through late eighties. Uh, not as strong as you know this time period, but. Uh, through the late 80s, they were pretty good. And then when Channel 12 took Vince's tape instead of Don's uh, recycled tape, that was quickly the end of Portland. And without TV, they dropped from a 1,000 people a week to a couple hundred. And that was all it wrote. Now, when when did that happen when the, the Channel 12 took Portland off the air in favor of, of the WWF? Actually, December 7th, the announcement came, 19... 19- 91 and then they were off the air at the end of uh the year they did three more they went off the air on the 28th then don held on sold to sandy bar and uh but then that ended in 1992 but yeah 1991 was the end of it and uh it happened really suddenly but you know vince's quality was far superior to the two camera shot static camera shot from the crow's nest 20 yards away it seemed like probably 15 from the ring don had at for a while only had very little lights over the ring not as bad as the kansas city early productions i will say but it was <laughs> it was brutal but portland was just what it was and it it made the money some from television but mostly just from building the crowds and coming you know uh, 2,000 people a week to the sports arena and then doing well on the towns. You know, when I say Portland, it's kind of, you know, it's a step up the ladder to go to, you know, Georgia or Florida, or wherever. You know, I'm, I'm not meaning that as a knock. You know, back in the day, guys got started one of two places. Barely anyone got big unless they went through Memphis or when they went through Portland. And, and you saw so many great stars use that as, as their, you know, use the Portland promotion as their launching pad. Sure. And that's, like I said earlier, that's how you got work. You didn't uh, have wrestling schools all over the place like you do nowadays to go and work out. It was still a really closed business and you needed a place to work and you needed a place where you could do the same gimmick in different ways pre-internet. And that's what you did. That's why you were in a, if you were in a territory, not homesteading, but you were three to six months in an area, maybe eight, and then you were off to somewhere else to learn a different style, to learn under different people. And that's how wrestlers got to be stars. They picked up, they came into the locker room, they listened, they watched, and they learned. Uh, I mean, it's a it's a day a days I I totally miss. I mean, you know, I I miss just getting the magazines and finding out what was going on all over the place. You know, and, including places like Portland and Memphis, and just you know having that fresh look. Like you know, a guy would have a run in the territory for six months or nine months, and then he would leave, and they'd bring in someone fresh. I just I just miss the whole set up. I know that, you know, it's impossible now. It's been impossible for at least 25, probably more than that, more like 30, 35 years. But I, I do miss the old territory days. And there were guys that did homesteads. You know, Buddy was Buddy was here. Mike Miller uh, lived here for a long time. So you had guys that did do that. But a lot of guys just moved from territory to territory because you couldn't. It was hard to stay on top, to stay fresh in the territories i look at some of the contracts or let's say if i watch aew um and i see a guy that's been there for three years i think oh, how many times have i seen him is he still fresh what have they done and so it, it there aren't a lot of places for those guys to go and be fresh and stay off of tv for a little while as jim Cornette says how can we miss you if you don't go it's away? so true, man. I mean, I, I miss the, the way the WWF did it. You know, Adrian Adonis would come in, Jesse Ventura would come in, and then Bob Backlund would beat them. But wait, here comes someone else. Here comes Bob Wharton Jr. Here comes Jimmy Snuka. They're undefeated. Oh, now Backlund got through those guys. Here, superstar Billy Graham's back. Big John Studd is here. It, it, it just kept everything so fresh and interesting. 
absolutely in in the things that we miss and i'm not i'm not knocking any of the AEW or WWE they're they're doing what they want to do they're doing what they think is is sells and obviously they do some good cuz they're doing some tv contract money it's just different and um you know, I, I don't begrudge any of them making a good living. Some of them are doing really, really well. No, absolutely. I mean, it would, it would literally be impossible to have territories in this day and age. It was, it was impossible by the late 80s. It just wasn't happening anymore. So, But on that happy note, Frank, thank you very much for coming on the final Stick to Wrestling of 2022. It was a great show, and we'll have you back soon. I appreciate it, and uh, everybody have uh... – a happy holiday, however you celebrate, and um, we'll be talking to you soon. Yes, and everyone have a excellent 2023. I hope the Stick to Wrestling has 52 Wicked Good and Raw Bone podcasts in the upcoming year. Uh, I want to thank uh, Brian Lass for giving me this podium. I want to thank Lou Kippelman for all of the great work he does. I want to thank everyone for listening. Thank you for listening for the past four and a half years, and hopefully in 52 weeks, it'll be five and a half years. And with that, this has been a presentation of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Go Vols, beat Clemson tonight. This concludes our podcast day. 